if one was taking a hormone every day, like the thyroid, for example, mm -hmm. you are, by consequence, putting that hormone into your blood, right? If you don't do some kind of monitoring um, and keep yourself in check, in balance, you run the risk of what they call down regulation. In other words, you put so much of that hormone into your blood that your own gland says, oh, we don't need to make this anymore. Just stop. OK, that doesn't happen with bioregulators because it, you're operating. You're not putting the hormone into your blood. You're instructing your genes to instruct your gland to produce those hormones. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of, Op of uh, Executive Health and Life. I almost said the old name, Executive Health and Life. I'm your host, Julian Hayes II, back at it again, and with one of my favorite words, a fascinating guest. And I am not, uh, I am not exaggerating this time because today we are talking about peptide bioregulators. You might be like, what in the world is that? I know you have heard me mention peptides, but maybe not the bioregulators. And this is something that's a secret tool. It's like being let in at a secret club now where there is you have to have a knock maybe three or four times and didn't say the special word but this tool has been used in the anti-aging longevity world for years now and it's just now scratching the mainstream world but barely but nevertheless my guess is someone who has been involved in the anti-aging community for well over 25 years now i believe he advises moderates and for numerous organizations including the british longevity society the monte carlo anti-aging congress the Stamboli conference on aging and cancer and the London Anti-Aging Conference. I'm speaking with none other than Phil Mikens, who is a pharmacologist, a co-founder, and vice president of Profound Health and Anti-Aging Systems, and much, much more. Phil, first of all, thank you for getting on the show. Secondly, you can do a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, Julian. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. And a big shout out to all your, your viewers. And I hope we can uh, interest them in some of the things we're going to chat about today. Well, absolutely. Uh, we, we are all interested in performing better and doing it for a longer time. And so yeah. just that simple notion right there would have people's uh, ears pinned up, especially with some of the information that I know you're about to discuss here. So before we start, um, I always like to get a bit of an origin story because normally with, with people that are into this health field, especially this, this kind of space, mm -hmm. there's usually a pain point when we were little, maybe, or in our adulthood, that, that steered us on this course. So what about yeah. yourself? Yeah, well, I think at least one, I've got two pain points, as you call them. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think one of them is a fairly common one, certainly with the people I've spoken to, and the other one slightly different. So one, the one thing that got me interested from an early age, at least from, say, a teenager, was um, I always felt that I was aging faster than my mates. Than, than my friends that were close to me uh, for various things. And that got me riled in a way. I thought, well, why do I seem to be aging more quickly than my friends? Um, that got me interested in the whole topic, I guess, of aging. And the other one was a, a, a not uncommon story, was basically having to visit, um, what I was perhaps in my early 20s then, um, a, a geriatric ward. And, and in fact, my uncle was in it due to an injury. Now, um, something we ought to point out, the word geriatric, if you ask a geriatric physician, what does the word mean? It actually only means one thing. It means being age 65 or older. Doesn't mean anything else. Oh. But in the public perception, of course, it means somebody who's a bit decrepit, a bit past it, whatever expression you want to use. So my poor uncle, who had all his marbles and was in, you know, otherwise in good health, despite being in his uh, 80, I think he was at the time, um, you know, was stuck in this ward, as it were. And I used to go along there and, you know, chat with him, play cards with him and chess or whatever it was to spend the time with him. And I noticed all the other guys who were in the ward and most of them were by the term we most of us understand geriatric you know they were some of them had regressed to their early childhood or whatever and some of them were more or less unconscious but being given dozens and dozens of drugs through the day and i and i just came to this very sad conclusion that i don't want to end up here how on earth what's sort of, and i have a little saying I, I say that i think there's two things we ought to do to school kids before they leave school one is get a day trip to a prison 
um, as, a, as an eye opener, say, you don't want to end up in here, do you? Have a think about what you do in your life. This is what prison's like, right? And the other one is take them along to a geriatric ward because maybe, hopefully, there'll be, there'll be people amongst them that might say, I'm going to cure this. We're going to get rid of this problem. Or, or at least they might think about their health long term because most people don't think about their health long term. If you did, why would you smoke? Why would you drink excess alcohol? Why would you, you know, eat McDonald's every day? You, you wouldn't. But people aren't thinking ahead 10 or 20 years or, or more. Most people probably not even thinking ahead one year. And, and that's a tragic consequence because the art of living is to live long. And, uh, you know, I, I love Blondie, you know, the, um, the musician. And of course, one of her songs was, um, you know, die young, stay pretty. Well, that may be nice to say when you're young, but as you get older, it, that's not really an option. So how do we how do we live longer? But fundamentally, how do we live well? Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, now that you brought up those points, I actually hit those two objectives in terms of uh, visiting a prison, did that in high school and then um, visited a, a clinic uh -huh. a long time. And then my father was on dialysis. And then um, when I was doing um, my going to medical school, yeah, I um did a lot of volunteering and one of those was in the burn unit. Now it's not geriatric, but geriatric, but it is like, you get to see, you get to see some really um, mm. bad things in some cool yeah. people and did some other areas as well. And it does give you perspective in the long yeah. term. Yeah. And uh, uh, you know, I started probably on my health journey, probably 19, 20 years old. And uh, I thought about one of the things was, okay, what happens when I'm 35? I just recently turned 37. Right. And and the goal was, when yeah. I'm 37, can I still perform like a 25-year-old yeah. in, in a lot of my things? And that's what I always had in mind, even in my early 20s, to keep that idea in my mind. Yeah, Because like you said, with health, and this is the thing with weight gain, right? You may, you may gain a couple pounds in a year, two pounds, but that's not really enough to move the needle. Mm -hmm. Then the next year, maybe it's a couple more, and then a mm -hmm. couple more. But a lot of things with health are slow, slow moving mm -hmm. that you don't notice it in that time. And then you just wake up in one sudden moment or some mm -hmm. event happens. And that's when you get a wake up call. Mm, that's true. I think eyesight declines like that. You know, take, for example, a cataract. I think most people who develop cataract over time, and that could even be years. At first, they don't notice it. And they're a little bit and a little. And then the day comes when, I don't know, they have to do their driving exam again or whatever. And suddenly it's, I really can't read that, you know. Or, or, of course, one eye will be a lot worse than the other, as it were, and there'll be some compensation of being going on. So you're absolutely right. Over t over short period, yeah. <laughs> the frightening thing in terms of aging is to go back to your um, filing cabinet or whatever mm -hmm. you have at home and dig out your old passports, because you know the passports generally you have to renew them every ten years generally, mm -hmm. and then go back. Well, I'm in my sixties now, so I could go back and look at a few of them and uh, think, God, I really did look like that then, didn't I? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you know, with, with eyesight, we're going to come back to that. It's going to be one of the regulators I want to talk about because um, I, I love the eyes. That's, you know, if I say, in, if I say it in school, that's what I want. I wanted to be an ophthalmologist. I love, I love the eyes, love the physiology of the right. eyes. Yeah. And, um, but the eyesight thing is, um, that, that's probably one of my pet peeves is that people just assume that, oh, cause I'm getting older chronologically that I just need to have poor eyesight. I, I, I just don't like that notion, but no, 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 I, agree with I'm not, I'm not gonna go in a soapbox. Let's um, let's start this whole conversation here. Um, let's do a, a let's learn what are peptide bioregulators, and then mm -hmm. also, I guess, what differentiates them from the peptides themselves. Mm -hmm. Okay, fine, absolutely. Well, of course, there are literally thousands and thousands of peptides. What are peptides? They are basically chains of amino acids. So, amino acids are, if you will, the fundamental building blocks of life. But as soon as two amino acids can join, it becomes known as a dipeptide. Some people believe that's what happened in the primeval swamps going back millions of years before life existed, that in those bubbling mud pools, two amino acids can join. And at that moment was information. And, and we'll get into that. So, of course, the more amino acids you, you can link and you can link to big, big numbers, we even start changing the name. So to come back, bioregulators 
that are defined as short chains of amino acids, this is two, three, or four amino acids can join. However, as I will explain shortly, not all two, three, four amino acid chains are bioregulators. There is a different meaning to the word as well. But as you go on to put more and more amino acids onto becoming other types of peptides, you can even start changing the names. You might start calling them proteins and you might even start calling them hormones. So to give one example, if we think about human growth hormone, okay, uh, I think a lot of people are aware of what that is. Um, that is actually an amino acid chain of 191 amino acids. That's a very, very long chain. And what does it mean when you get some of these from a practical point of view, of a use point of view, what does it mean when you have these very long chains of amino acids? Well, it means you cannot take them orally. They're not digestible orally. They have to be injected or perhaps used as a nasal spray or something like that. But the one of the advantages of these bioregulators is because they're very short, they can be used orally. They are absorbed into blood. OK, there's some other factors here as well. So um, this discovery, the original discovery of short chain peptides was made in Russia. Um, made by a very famous man, I think, called Pavlov, um, who was the, you know, I think all of us know about Pavlov's dogs, mm -hmm. you know, how we ring a bell and they got served their lunch and he rang the bell and then they started salivating to expect their lunch. So he came from the St. Petersburg Institute of Biogerontology. He was the original discoverer of these short chains of peptides. And moving forward, I mean, he did that in, what, the 30s, the 40s, something around that time. Um, moving fasting forward to sort of the 80s, uh, 1980s, it was another member of that same institute, a man by the name of Professor Vladimir Kavinson, who went on to discover that these short chains of amino acids are gene switches. So let's bear in mind that they're, they're in foods, they're in different food groups. So... For me, when I first discovered these in 2009 or thereabouts, 2010, um, for me, it was like a light bulb moment because the realization that there is another agent in food. We all know that, you know, vitamins are in food and minerals are in food and fats are in food and fibers in food. But now we know that different foods carry different peptides by regulators and that they act as specific gene switches. So for me, it explains the epigenetics of food. Yeah. Sure. Um, but it, it goes on to be something incredibly fundamental. So like I say, there are a gazillion peptides out there uh, and we change the names depending on the length of those peptides, but these bioregulators are particularly short ones. How many bioregulators are there right now? Well, officially available on the market uh -huh. there are 21 okay. however they have discovered i think nearly 50 oh. with because although i'm sure a lot of folks listening will say well i've never heard of these etc this was work that was started in the 1980s in the soviet union and was actually for the first 20 odd years a, 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 a soviet military secret OK, these supplements, if you will, and they are injections as well, as well as oral supplements, um, they were used then by their elite, elite troops, their cosmonauts and, yes, their Olympic teams. This information is now in the public domain. It's been in the public domain for about 15 years. One of the problems has been that over that time, guess what? It was all in Russian. Mm -hmm. So unless you were fluent Russian, you didn't know. But now I wouldn't say all of it, but I would say most of it is in English. So with, and it's been published and it's, you know, it's, it, it's kind of open source material. Now I've helped write at least two books on this subject. One scientific book, uh, which we've called, in fact, it's sitting here in front of me. So I may as well put it up. Yeah. Um, Peptides in the epigenetic control of aging. This is a scientific book, though. This goes into detail about what they are and how they work. And another one, which unfortunately is not in front of me right now, but it's on Amazon, and that's called um, The Peptide Bioregulator Revolution. Uh, and that's a public book as an introduction to the public. So um, 
so with that in mind, um, there's still a lot more to be discovered, you know, uh, but what they mainly are, well, I won't go through all 21 and bore everybody, but, but you've got a lot of glands. So you've got like thymus and thyroid and adrenal and pancreas and pineal and things like that. Uh, and there are some tissues, you know, and there are some organs. So there would be say stomach and lungs and heart. So, uh, they do cover a wide area. They do cover a wide area. So when you're taking these, like how do they exactly like work on the body? So, cause when I hear bioregulator, I think of something like homeostasis that is going mm -hmm. to bring it back to like the equilibrium. Is that yeah. kind of the right frame? Yeah, that's a very good expression. Uh, another one that's often used because there are foods that are known to do this adaptogens. Mm -hmm. So there, there, there are plants that are known to be adaptogens. My question now, although I haven't been involved in this research is, are they adaptogens because they contain these peptides, right? Could be, be because I could mention, very briefly to you that there's very recent studies and i do mean very recent studies done by the uh, university of um, tel aviv in israel where they've used some of these uh, bioregulators in plants and specifically strawberries and what they've been able to show is that when these strawberries receive these peptides they produce 20 to 30 percent more fruit than the strawberries that don't so although we haven't got into it yet there have been studies, of course, in vitro, in, in other words, in a laboratory, in glass, um, in animals, in humans and in plants. And they have shown to be work. So it's something really fundamental, a really basic switch. And what they do, um, and as I say, because of the nature of what they are, they do work orally. OK, they, they are by and the, one of the reasons they work all is apart from them being very short chains of amino acids, so they don't get broken down too badly, um, is they're nano sized, right? They're very, very small. They're nano sized and they act directly. And the Russians have got the most amazing slides you'll ever see. Um, in fact, sometimes you have to put 3D glasses on to actually see them interact. It's really quite a nice experience um, where they'll show a specific gene and they'll show the peptides arriving and it's linking at certain points and it's almost like a key going into a lock and you see and this is this is where it, this is where the rabbit hole this is where we open the rabbit hole now okay they either activate or they silence that specific gene now even professor cavinson has not at least told me when i asked him that they know exactly why how do they know to silence or to activate okay and this if you think, let's take, uh, make it make life easy. Let's take the thyroid. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if you have genes that are responsible for activating your thyroid to produce more thyroid hormones, then naturally, if you activate that gene as a consequence, it takes a little time. It doesn't, you know, it's not like taking a, a drug, a hormone. It's not an instant effect, but nonetheless, over a short period of time, your thyroid gland will produce more thyroid hormones endogenously naturally okay you're not forcing it however if you are making and, and of course there is a large part of the adult population who are hypothyroid to some degree they're not making enough the late great dr broder barnes estimated um in the 80s i think it was that over 50 percent of the adult population was hypothyroid so most of them don't know right we just get on with their lives now, I met his pupil, a lovely man by the name of Dr. Rick Wilkinson, who's still practicing in Washington State today. And I asked him the same question. And I said, uh, you know, your mentor was Broder Burns. You know, 30 years ago, he said 50 percent of the adult population uh, was hypothyroid. What do you reckon? Is it better or worse? He said worse. He said it's over 60 percent. Oh, geez. So, yeah. So that's bad. that's bad news. Right. So and. and I, I'm only mentioning thyroid because when one fixes one thyroid, a lot of good things happen. Yeah. Right? It's one of those things that a lot of, and there's so many things attributable to it. You think it's, it's hard to believe it's one whole, you know, your sleep, your metabolism, your temperature, all sorts of stuff. Right. Um, so, but here's the crazy thing, right? If you were hyperthyroid, which is more rare, of course, in other words, your thyroid gland is producing too many thyroid hormones, and, and you're a completely different person, right? You're, you've got too much, dare I say it, you've got too much energy. You, they often have uh, 
they're up, they're very bright, wide eyed, bushy tailed, yeah. you know, uh, deer in the headlight look. Um, some people have said the Mona Lisa was probably hyperthyroid because of the way she looks. Mm -hmm. Um, and, 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 and they have so much energy, you know, you think, wow, these people are amazing to be around, but it's hype. It could be hypothyroidism. Here's the crazy thing being bioregulators in those cases, it will silence the genes. And what they end up doing is they end up bringing the thyroid in into like an adaptogen, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, into this band of how should we call it normality. OK, now our bodybuilding friends are not very pleased to hear that when I say to them, if you take the testes peptide as a man, then we'll get into that because obviously women don't have testes and therefore oh, is that controversial um, <laughs> <laughs> i'm just looking at this as a scientific perspective not a political one um <laughs> and uh, on that level it doesn't going to do anything for the ladies and the same thing there's an ovary peptide doesn't do anything for the men there's a prostate peptide doesn't do anything for the women that's the only three the, the, the everything else we're sharing okay but mm -hmm. obviously in some instances we don't so but with the male bodybuilders i say listen if you're already using other methods to raise your testosterone levels this thing is not going to activate your genes because it, it knows so it said it, you cannot get superlogical levels of hormones with these peptides but that brings us back to safety because the Russians, and when I say Russians, folks, I mean the Russian-speaking countries, right? So these things are available in the Ukraine, in Russia, in Kazakhstan, you know, in Armenia, in Georgia, and other countries and of Russian-speaking peoples. And they have been for many, many, many years. Kavinson reckons they've been dosed to millions of people, probably 100 million times or more uh, in terms of dosages, never have never has a serious side effect ever been reported whoa okay so, so just to stop there real quick so that's a lot of people so this is so this is not even something that's like i have to go get a prescription for or this is like something that's commonplace it is now if it was injectable mm -hmm. you'd have to go get a prescription right. because by definition an injection is a drug if mm -hmm. you put vitamin c in a vial it and you're going to inject it it becomes a drug okay nasal sprays same thing right okay but the oral versions are food supplements so they're over the counter that's amazing wow hmm. so there's a lot to this and 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 i think the most amazing side to this story is um that folks say oh yes it sounds tremendous technology but we need time don't we to make sure i said we've had time we've got 40 years yes. of published data that's been released by by the russians by the ukrainians by the kazakhstanis etc 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 it's all there now sometimes sometimes i hear us western people or some western person because they grew up with the cold war um say oh, but you can't trust them can you right for whatever reason. and i said oh, i'd rather you look at the science than the politics but but uh, but then I turn around and say, well, would you trust an American doctor? And normally the answer is, of course, yes. And I say, why? And then I'd like to point you to the work of Dr. Bill Lawrence, who lives in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. um, and he's been studying these now for four or five years. He has 120 people in his clinical trials. Um, you know, he's been mimicking the, the Russian protocols and all of his patients have benefited in various ways. And we didn't mention it, but I'm the editor of a magazine called Aging Matters, and we have published his work in, in that magazine. It's, it's designed for the public. Um, and, you know, and of course, fascinatingly, Bill has been uh, doing things with his patients that perhaps the Russians didn't do in the 90s because it was difficult to get. There are certain tests now that were very, very hard to do 20 and 30 plus years ago. For example, telomere testing. Mm -hmm. uh, or the Horvath clock, the, the DNA methylation. And he's showing that all his patients improve their telomere length, in other words, they get longer, and um, improve their DNA methylation as well. So uh, with its, which is probably the single best biological age measurement we have. 
Yeah. Okay. Um, we, we can get into that if you want to. But so, you know, so there's a doctor, 120 patients. Uh, they've all been in at least three years of clinical trial. And the results are there to be seen. So, you know, it is beginning to get out there. And I know lots and lots of other doctors from all parts of the world who are using it on their patients who report, but of course they haven't done it in a clinical sense. They've done it in their own practices, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But Bill is, you know, he's doing it on a, on a formal process. Yeah. Um, so the information is getting out. So like you said at the top of this, Julian, you know, this stuff has been out there a long time, but as is so often the case, I'm afraid in health and medicine, mm -hmm. it can take decades before the general public get to actually learn of it. Yeah. I mean, just, I mean, for, for example, fasting is a craze right now. Mm. I mean, my goodness, uh, we were doing these alternate day fasts and five days fast, three days fast. We were, I was noticing back in university. So I was probably, I was just back 2005, six ish. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. I mean, so it's over a decade that just yeah. that kind of information. Yeah. Most of the world's major religions, um, the way I look at them is, is whichever book you like to read, um, there's information in there that they didn't understand at the time, mm -hmm. you know, like, um, I don't know, don't sleep around because, you know, God will send you a venereal disease. Well, they didn't understand the process of it, but, it, but uh, don't eat, ha have periods where you don't eat, you know, go off into the <laughs> desert and fast for a few days or whatever. So I don't, okay. They didn't understand why, but actually it was all basic information that they were trying to pass on to future generations so you're absolutely right um nothing new under the sun right it, it's just perhaps that we get more detail right. in understanding it but but there are some basic things and, and you're absolutely right you know fasting is a good thing uh and now we're discovering of course it doesn't mean that you have to go days without food it yeah. might be 16 hours so you know yeah and so i'm going to come back to the horde clock and, mm. and and some of that stuff because um I, I mean, to start using that, because I, I, I've i done age testing myself and telomere testing as well. And yeah. so, um, and then it's also a way for, like I said, when a lot of us are coaching, advising other people, not clinically, as they say, but lifestyle, right? Exactly. Lifestyle. Yeah. Health, health and fitness. Health, health, and fitness. health and fitness, right? That's, that's how we call it. Yeah. And uh, these kind of things are, are valuable because then you can say that, okay, these things that maybe people might look at you weird for or, or just maybe a little foreign to you we can back it up and mm. we have something to measure it against. So I'm going to come back to that. But beforehand, I saw when I was doing a little research, I saw that there was this, uh, a particular study in Siberia about the effects of mortality and morbid yeah. morbidity on these with these regulators. I thought that was yeah. pretty cool. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think one of the incredible things under the Soviet Union, because of course then it was a communist state, and Kavanson actually got a call in the 80s directly from the Kremlin and he was um, a colonel in the medical corps so uh, at that time. So they said to him, you know, we've got troops in uh, nuclear submarines, in nuclear silos, and, uh, th and there were certain weapons they wanted to um, get their troops guarded against, lasers on the battlefield that would make them go blind. They said, find things that will help our troops. And that's how it started, okay? And they went down you know, different avenues, as it were. But it was designed originally to assist their military. Um, but they soon started using them when they discovered it. And they, one of the fundamentals is it induces protein synthesis. So you get repair done a lot faster. And when you think about, say, for example, cosmonauts or astronauts, if you want to use another terminology, um, going up to space is a, is a hazardous environment. You know, uh, and even if the astronauts, cosmonauts exercise in space, they still deteriorate. And when they if they stay up there for a long time, like a year or something, and then they come back to the planet, they really struggle to to get back on track. So they that's when the peptides really help them recover very quickly. One story that shocks a lot of people is the uh, when the London Olympics took place, which I can't remember the date, but it wasn't that long ago. Um, there was a Russian um, female gymnastic team that won gold medal. OK, so there was about, I don't know, six or eight of these young ladies, you know, sort of 18 to 21 or something like that. And 
they won gold so they're in the olympics so they're top of their game right and of course if you look at them you go wow they're fit you know of course they would be wouldn't they mm -hmm. but this is where we get into the concept of hormesis which hormesis is mild stress and this is a theory by uh, Suresh Rattan, Professor Suresh Rattan out of Denmark. And basically, mild stress is good for us. And that's what exercise is, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's a mild stress, a little bit of damage to the muscles, and then it repairs and it grows and so on and so forth. But like everything in life, the curve is either bell-shaped or you inverted, and you want to be in the middle. You know, you don't want to drink too little water but you don't want to drink too much water, right? And it's kind of true of everything. You want to be in the middle. So doing over-exercise, which obviously training for the Olympics and what have you is push, 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 push. And what they were shocked at was when these girls returned to Russia after winning gold, they did their telomere tests and they were twice their age. They were 40-year-olds in terms of telomere testing. And they put them on the peptides and they recovered very quickly. OK, so it's part of the uh, pro inducing protein synthesis. And also, uh, this is a, this is where aerobics in older people is a dual edged sword because all that rapid uptake of oxygen. So if you're a long distance runner or I don't know, in the Ironman competition or something extreme um, and you're older, your body doesn't have the natural defenses it had when it was in its 20s. Um, and. It can be very damaging. And if you want to know more about that side of things, I highly recommend a book written by a free radical expert. Uh, his name is Dr. Richard Littman. Lovely man, Richard. And he wrote a book called Stay 40. And he describes free radicals, our natural defenses to them, the right, the best supplements to negate them. But he also shows the damaging effect of over aerobic exercise in the over 40s. Okay. Okay, I got and, a few more years. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a generalarity. You know there are yeah, some. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. I'm just, I'm just yeah. joking. I'm just joking with you. We got all, we got all these toys and everything. So, but yeah, I, I know what you mean. So you know, this is this is where I kind of come in. Is as we age, what can we do as we age to protect ourselves? Because you know, there's two ways forward with health and fitness, isn't there? The two ultimate ways. Either we prevent the bloody problem in the first place, right? Because we don't really want disease, do we? Um, we prevent the problem, that's fantastic. But should we start on the path towards that problem or God forbid, get the problem, then we want to regenerate. It could, I, I try to avoid the word rejuvenate, so that's the most fabulous word, but regenerative medicine, right? Why not take, you know, make us biolo biologically younger wherever possible, obviously. So, um, yeah, the bioregulators in, in my over 30 years of being in the business and I've gone through various, um, I hesitate to use the word fads, but there's always been demands for certain things. OK, so in my early career, um, and I'm not saying those demands have gone away, but in the early career, everyone wanted to talk about smart drugs, nootropics, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. Uh, later on, bioidentical hormones, and they still are, and they're still very powerful tools, don't get me wrong. But today, it's definitely peptides, without without doubt. And let me just say this about the bio. I can't say it of all peptides, can't say it of all peptides, but let me say this about these bioregulators that we're focusing on. If one was taking a hormone every day, like the thyroid, for example, mm -hmm. you are, by consequence, putting that hormone into your blood, right? If you don't do some kind of monitoring um, and keep yourself in check, in balance, you run the risk of what they call downregulation. Mm -hmm. In other words, you put so much of that hormone into your blood that your own gland says, oh, we don't need to make this anymore. Just stop. OK, that doesn't happen with bioregulators because it, you're operating. You're not putting the hormone into your blood. You're instructing your genes mm. to instruct your gland to produce those hormones. And as we've already alluded to, there is this activate and silencing mechanism. So you're not going to go over. It's going to keep you within this bandwidth. I think that's what explains their safety factor. Um, I'm not recommending, of course, that people don't monitor themselves. 
-hmm. that's not what i say but i can say that there is a far greater brand bandwidth of safety mm -hmm. than by using hormones yeah and if anything when you're monitoring yourself i think it's just good especially with stuff like this is you get to actually see things that are improving yes uh, and i think that's that's the thing that uh is, is most amazing is that mm -hmm. i you know you can just pick a body part say like i don't know maybe your lungs or something your lungs are messed up when you go to the doctor or something or they're not mm -hmm. at their capacity they should be. Sure. maybe you use some of these regulators for a while mm -hmm. and you go back and you, you you can compare and contrast the difference most likely Absolutely. i think there's a good argument julian um for whatever you do um could be exercise could be taking vitamins could be having a sauna every day <laughs> you know it could be taking more specialist supplements like these peptides hormones whatever you know do a before and after you know i mean if everything i think comes down to cost and convenience right yeah if you, if, if the program you're going to go on is very costly it's going to make you think twice about it isn't it if you're going to go on a program that's very inconvenient for your lifestyle it's going to make you think think twice about it so if you have a program that you say i can afford that it fits into my lifestyle it's not really inconvenient you're much more likely to to go with it and adapt to it um so i think everything comes into that category but even if you throw a load of vitamins and minerals down yourself every day ask yourself are you at least wasting your money and did you do any before and afters? Did you discover that you were low in B12, just as an example, mm -hmm. um, and required it? You know, and then you started taking the B12. Did you did you insert even in six months? It doesn't have to be every week or anything. And of course, there are physical things that you can test yourself for. Um, I'm always fascinated. Not that I'm a big expert on testing. I'll say that right now. But you know, I'm always fascinated about what doctors did before there were blood tests. Right. What was the old fashioned way of doing it? And the classic, I sorry, I keep raising the thyroid, but it's a nice, easy one is what's your morning temperature? When you get out of bed first thing in the morning, take your temperature because that's the thyroid pointing to my neck because it's there. Mm -hmm. That's that's the, the thyroid because it's regulating our body temperature. It's very, very important to keep it within a really very narrow bandwidth. What is it? write it down you know it's so easy to take a, a you know put it on your forehead stick it in your ear beep you've got the temperature write that down and over about two weeks go and have a look and see what number comes up the most and you'll be shocked how close they are now, i'm sorry i'm going to talk in celsius somebody will have to get the calculator out to work out fahrenheit but your normal healthy thyroid is between 36.3 and 36.7 celsius so if you're seeing those numbers okay 97 that's uh 36.3 is 97 degrees fahrenheit okay cool so if you're over that and uh, and you're within uh what uh point um four c then you're fine if you're regularly over 36 6.7 then you're hyperthyroid you've got too much going on but if you're regularly below 36.3 and i've even had patients in the 34s which is horrendously low right um uh, then you you could do with some thyroid support okay there, and i'm not saying that peptides is the only answer there are many ways of going several ways of going at this um so and that is a way of, and, and again i just come back to the fact that if you get your metabolism back and you get your uh, your, your sleep cycles will improve and uh, you'll probably drop some weight and you know there's been a whole bunch of things going on there you'll feel more energized you might even lift any depression that might be going on you know there's a lot of things happen uh, the adrenal glands is another one and i'm pointing this out because there are certain peptides i find that when the patients use them mm -hmm. um they get i get the quickest responses i get the within a month or so within one to three months this is a i would say is a typical time period okay don't give up on them within three months okay it will depend on all sorts of other reasons but if you're using the protocol correctly, uh, and we can get into that, mm -hmm. then one to three months should be a time scale where you should see some kind of benefit improvement. And if you're keeping some kind of daily, weekly record, whether it's through blood or physical or whatever, or temperature in the case of the thyroid, mm -hmm. you will see those changes, or you certainly should see those changes. Um, so, 
which which is great you know and then you you know you, you're taking the right product because otherwise it's like having a shotgun mm -hmm. if you take a whole bunch of vitamins and everything what you're doing really is a shotgun approach i maybe i'll hit the target I'll, but if you've got a rifle you know bang you're you, you know you're on target so that's the way i look at it much more precision as well so i i just wrote that down that we will come back to the protocol but the thing that we wanted to come back to even before that was also the Horvath clock yes. in, in terms of measuring aging. Because that I think that's, that's like you said, one of the best, if not the best um, yeah. tool, tool right now in that regard. Yeah, it's actually, um, why did I say it's probably the, the best single biological age measure? I don't believe that, that if you're going to evaluate your own biological age, it is actually very hard to do because, and I have actually been involved with making a piece of software many years ago that took in up to 150 different markers. And we realized very early on that getting that one number that everyone wants, my biological age is, and then of course, they're delighted when they're under their chronological age and they're upset when they're over their chronological age, uh, <laughs> as always. But it was very, very hard because there were all, you know, one, you might do a just to throw some things out there right you might do a dhea test and the report might say oh, bad news you're 10 years older on your dhea but you might do an eyesight test and find you're five years younger and so on and so on and so forth so it's very hard to get this one uniform number but you might be able to look at certain bio some biological age markers are critical now for example the graying of hair uh, although my daughter says it's white now, mine, um, is, um, you know, a biological age marker. But here's the good news. It's not going to kill me. Right. So on the other hand, you know, I've got certain heart markers or whatever that are OK or good, which is great, because if I had bar if I had some bad cardiovascular markers, mm -hmm. well, yes, I could be dead tomorrow. You know, so we have to wait certain mark hand grip strength for example is quite a well-known decent biological age marker but is it vital is it is it life-threatening you know so you know there are certain problems with biological age measurement but let's come back sorry to the horvath so stephen horvath uh who's a doctor from i believe ucla he determined how dna methylates and he came up with this biological age clock which has become uh, named after him the horvath clock and it's one of those that is incredibly narrow because there are certain biological age measurements where you might do it and they'll say all oh, right uh, you're 37 julian uh well well done because this this marker you're 20 mm -hmm. and you go great yeah oh hang on but this marker you're 50. And you go, oh, no, you know, but they can be, what I'm saying is there can be very wide mm -hmm. discrepancies, okay? But the Horvath test seems to be particularly narrow, okay? It's it's pretty rare if it's plus or minus four years, okay? And that makes it one of the hardest to change. And, and I have heard rumor, although I can't tell you which ones because I don't know, but I've heard rumor there are some police forces who are now if they go to a scene of a crime and they find some blood or whatever saliva whatever and they think it's from the perpetrator they take the sample what can they find out they can find out the blood group they can find out the sex um, and of course if they got the dna on file then they know who the person is if they haven't got the dna on file what else can they know from this saliva? All they can do is keep the sample in the hope that if they get the person, they match the two samples, right? But otherwise, what can they know? Well, I've heard that some of them are now using the Horvath test because they can now say plus or minus four or five years what the age of the person is. So now they know they're looking for a 30-year-old or a 40-year-old or what, right? Ah. So that's a tool the police haven't had before. So with that in mind, um and there is a formula which i'm sorry i haven't got it in front of me but it we have published this in our aging matters magazine that shows the risk of increased mortality if your horvath age is older than your chronological age mm -hmm. and unfortunately it's not linear so for example if it was 
if we said five years increases plus increases your mortality by 100 percent four years isn't 75 50 25 it doesn't go like that unfortunately it kind of goes up big so in other words one year it might be like a 10 percent increase in mortality older two years might be a 15 percent you know what i mean three years is like 35 it goes up like that and it's something similar in reverse okay not quite as good actually which is rather you know depressing in other words if i'm five years younger mm -hmm. on my from my chronological age on a Horvath test i might be I might decrease my chance of mortality by 50%. That's a big number. Still, good. Right? Still worth it, right? But if I'm five years older, I increase it by 150%. Right? <laughs> so it, it's skewed. But ha having said that, the name of the game, of course, in anti aging is to try and be as biologically young as you can. Mm -hmm. So, so that's in essence the Horvath test. It is perhaps the most accurate. And it is the hardest to change. Um, and actually, although it's a few years old now, Dr. Horvath did make a statement saying he didn't know any way, apart from saying stop smoking and stop drinking and, you know, all that stuff, mm -hmm. all the basics. He didn't know any other way. Certainly, you might slow it down, but not to improve it. Well, Bill Lawrence, come back to Dr. Bill Lawrence in Atlanta with these 120 patients. That's exactly what he's seeing using these bioregulators. He is decreasing the patient's Horvath age. Oh, wow. Words, they are improving their DNA methylation. And I think if I remember correctly, and please don't hold me to it, the best result they've seen is a reversal of five years. Now, that's a big number mm -hmm. for the Horvath clock. On the telomeres, the best number, I, I spoke to him a couple of months ago, so I, it may have been different by now, but um, I think the biggest number they saw was an in, a decrease in biological age on telomeres of nine years, So, which is a bigger. You can get bigger numbers on telomeres. I accept that, okay? But that's both, in other words, longer telomeres for that particular patient. So it's all good news. And, and by the way, these are not young people. There are no 20 year olds. I don't even think there are any 30 year olds in his study. I think if I remember rightly, everyone's between sort of 40 and 80. Oh, yeah. And by oh. the way, most of them are medical doctors. Really weirdly. Don't ask me how that happened, but it's, yeah, they are. I'm going to have to look this up. This sounds very interesting to, to look at this. Um, okay. So now let's go to, um, I think we set a good foundation. Let's go, let's dive into some of these different regulators, protocols, and, and that kind of thing. And then I have it, and I'll go from there. Um, I guess the first good place to start is someone's probably hearing about this. They're going to the website. They see there's like 21 that are on the market right now. Mm -hmm. So, how in the world would I know where to start, what mm -hmm. to use? And I think this probably goes into probably your recommended protocol. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um it's added complication sorry about this there are natural versions which at the moment are bovine extracted and there are synthetics there aren't quite as many synthetics as there are naturals when i said 21 i was referring to the naturals okay okay um so just just put that out there the other thing i'm i don't want to really get into to bore everybody is the name change the brand names and all that oh my god it's like learning another language uh, one of the hardest things with our jobs is to learn the chemical names, the brand names, another name for it, you know. Um, and the Russians really confused it because they, they named it one name if it was natural, another name if it was synthetic, another name if it was injected. Another, oh, so you could have the same thing with four different names. So we'll you know, just stick with the gland. Yes, you know, I was, I was going to say something like that, right? That was actually going to be one of my questions that I was, I was like, make sure to ask them because – so I was looking at, for example, the blood vessel one, um, and we'll come. We'll talk about that one. I, yeah. I'm sure. Uh, yeah. And I saw the synthesized was Vesigen, and then I saw the natural was Ventforth, and then all these other different ones. I was like, this is like, this is like I'm going to have to like learn this in a class again. Yeah, I know, I know. We we've tried very hard on our websites. We we will list brand names, you know, w when you go to the store. But when you read the information, we just refer. 
as a synthetic or a natural. Most of the studies, by the way, are on the naturals. OK, I, I can tell you a little bit of a difference we've seen in, in, in the clinical side of things between between naturals and synthetics, if you want. By the way, I apologize because you did ask me a question earlier and I didn't finish it for you. You said to me there was a trial in Siberia. OK, and I should have mentioned that because it is very important, actually. And also that will lead us directly to what I think Perfect. are the core three peptides. OK, OK, um, from the studies. Um, and, and that was a study in as correctly stated in Siberia, um, in nearly 12,000 people. I mean, you don't remember under the Soviet Union, you know, Communist Party, if they want it, they do it and they do everything in a big way. Right. Mm -hmm. So they, they took 12,000 people who worked in Gazprom, that's oil and gas workers, people working in Siberia. So this is not office workers in New York. Right. This is it's pretty tough environment straight away. OK. Uh, and I think about 3,000 of them, uh, if memory serves me right, were put on to a placebo, which were basically multi-bits, okay? So they didn't know whether they were getting peptides and they didn't know whether they were getting multi-bits. So they followed these people up. They followed the core of these people up over six years. They followed another uh, percentage of them up over another four or five years. And then 1,000 people were taken on beyond 12 years now bear in mind when these people started they were sort of aged 35 to 60. so some of these people at the end of 12 years you know 77 78 you know had retired obviously and all the rest of it and yet they they, they followed them up now it was true that they changed the protocols over time but there were three core um peptides i'm not saying they were the only peptides used but there were three principal ones and they were the pineal the thymus and the blood vessel okay and to that point and we'll come on to how you choose and what you do but those are the three i take on a regular basis and i'll get into why i personally do that but what did they discover let's get to the brass tacks, as they say. What what did they discover? They discovered that the people who the workers who took the peptides compared to the workers who took the vitamins, they had one third of the morbidity. So in other words, those taking peptides suffered one third of the problems of the people who didn't. A reduction of 66% in problems medical problems okay well that's a big number straight away okay and shockingly they went on to find in the long-term studies especially you know like after the 12-year point where people are getting into their 70s and i want people to understand that living in that part of russia people do not have as length an average as lengthy lives as we do if everyone's thinking, well, you know, we all live to about 80 average, they don't in that part of the world, right? Or they didn't, mm -hmm. okay? So what did they find with the folks taking the peptides in mortality, in deaths? Yes, very similar number. They had two thirds less deaths, okay? So something really fundamental is going on. Cavinson, Professor Cavinson, the, ma the main man, he refers to this as a biological reserve. He actually says that every cell in the human body has a biological reserve of about 30% and that these peptides are actually activating this biological reserve. Okay. Now, is it a coincidence? I just put this out there as an idea for people to, I don't know, have a beer tonight and think about. Um, <laughs> Is it a coincidence that the average age of death in the West is about 80 and yet the maximum verifiable lifespan is about 120? I mean, Jean Clement was 122, nearly 123, but 120 is really the upper limit. A difference of about, oh, 30 percent. So this number keeps coming up this around 30 percent number keeps coming up in all do you remember i did i oh i can't remember if we said it when we had the pre-chat or pro but they did a, a study on plants in pre-chat pre 
sorry. So let me just tell folks, very recent research, I mean, literally months old, um, comes out of Tel Aviv. They use some of these peptides in strawberry plants and the strawberries that had the peptides produced about, oh, 30 percent more fruit than the ones who didn't. So there's something very fundamental going on here because the studies have been in the laboratory, what we call in vitro, in glass. They've been in animals, they've been in humans, and now they're in plants. And they operate in all of them because they're, they're, they're the peptides in foods that we all consume one way or another, and we know their gene switches. So it's very fundamental, very fundamental. Mm. So pineal, thymus, and, and uh, the blood yes. vessel. Yes, I would. Now, how do you choose? Let's let's go back and ask that question, that that sixty four trillion dollar question mm -hmm. used to be million, but that's not very much money anymore, is it? No, um, unfortunately not. <laughs> sixty four <laughs> trillion dollar question. Um, so what do any of us choose to do in anything? You, you know, you're sitting at home and, you, and you're watching this because obviously you're interested in health and wellness and great good on you that's a great subject to be interested in um how do you choose what to do what kind of why did you chose that kind of exercise over that kind of exercise why do you eat that kind of food over that kind of food why do you take a sauna every week what you know we could ask all those questions so when it comes to using supplements whether they be hormones or drugs or food supplements or whatever right why did you why did you make that choice well I think fundamentally, there are probably two reasons, okay? And the first one um, is uh, perhaps the most important one. What is your weak point? Now, if you have a problem, if you know you're diabetic, if you know, um, I don't know, you've got arthritis or you're going to go for it, right? You're going to say, oh, every time I move, my knee hurts, my hip, you're going to focus on that. It's going to get your attention uh, or my eyesight's failing or whatever it is that's your weak point that so it's only natural that you start there and rightly so and rightly so now if you're a nice healthy person and you're doing pretty okay um how do you know well there's two ways isn't there really one you actually go out and have some tests done and then you discover your telomeres aren't that good or you know your hormones are a bit low or whatever it is and then you've got something to focus on. If you don't even know that, I would suggest look at your family history. What did dad die of? What did grandma die of? Whatever, right? I mean, unfortunately, there are three diseases that carry around with most families, and it could be heart disease, senile dementia, or um, uh, uh, cardiovascular, okay? And I suppose diabetes as well. So. You might want, if you want to look to the future and see what your grandparents died of or your parents died of, that may be a focus for you. Because now you know you have a, you might have, of course, you can go and get the tests, mm -hmm. you can have the genetic tests and find out. That would be wonderful if you do that. So I think those are the ways. And then there is also the aesthetic side, isn't there? People don't like their skin or they don't like their hair or whatever. Then that's another choice. That's another choice. So all these decisions we base on. So if you're deciding which bioregulators you want to use, what are your weak points? If you know you have weak adrenal glands, as an example, that's an easy decision. Take the adrenal peptide, right? Mm -hmm. So that, or what your parents suffered from. So now you're, you, you're perhaps using it as a preventative, okay? And we can talk about dosages and how they change between treatment and prevention. Um, so I think that would be the prime places to start. If you're really not sure after all that, then my recommendation are those three peptides mm -hmm. that I mentioned because they were shown in very large clinical trials to have long term benefit for people, you know, over decades um, in reducing their morbidity and their mortality. So. And as, I think there's a number of reasons for that. If you will, excuse me, Julian, I'll just quickly talk about those three. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. The pineal 
as a gland holds a very special place for me in terms of in my earlier career i worked a lot with the great italian doctor walter Pierpoli, and walter is a melatonin expert oh i read that book a long time ago exactly he wrote all the early books you know he's a big big man in the world of, of melatonin and mm -hmm. the pineal etc and i think we all know if you draw if you take the center of your forehead and then you do another one over the tops of your ears and you drew two lines you'd find the center of your brain and there you would find this p-shaped and sized gland called the pineal and as we know it reacts to light so when we get into darkness, i.e. when we go to bed, um, it starts to produce melatonin. And melatonin, uh, it does a number of things, but the principal thing about melatonin is it tells the entire endocrine system when to produce its hormones. In other words, it's now melatonin's in the blood, it's nighttime, guys, take it easy shut down in most cases right and then once sun comes up morning comes melatonin starts to leave the blood the pineal gland stops producing it and a lot of hormones come up so first thing in the morning you're going to have that um pulsite release of growth hormone testosterone whatever right most hormones are at their highest first thing in the morning it's the get up and go impetus that's not to say they don't produce smaller pulsite waves later on measurable as in blood i'm talking about that that's still true but walter once described the pineal gland to me like this and it has stuck with me ever since because i thought it was a brilliant concept he said phil he said think of um the pineal gland as the conductor of the endocrine orchestra so that's all the other glands in the body endocrine okay so and he I said, what do you mean he said well if you have an orchestra and you don't have a conductor, what does it do? It makes noise, but you give it a conductor, it makes music. And it's pretty well known that either through melatonin or through the normal um, operations of pineal, you end up on your circadian rhythms. In other words, day, night, day, night, day, night. Because we all know what it's like to suffer two or three nights with no sleep. We know how bad we all feel right and that's why unfortunately a lot of the people who work on jet aircraft have a lot of problems because they're in this they're in australian time zone this week and they're on they're in new york time zone that week and all the rest of it's a mess especially for the ladies with their with their periods etc um so that's one th and shift workers of course who work maybe work days and then work nights or whatever so so if you get nice healthy circadian rhythm you get hormonal cyclicity and when you've got hormonal cyclicity you've got a strong immune system so that's fundamental. So I think the pineal peptide has a role in all of that. And it does. I think it does two things fundamentally. Well, we know it does. One, it helps our pineal gland, especially as we get older, because it's about getting older and the decline in, for various reasons in our body's ability um, to, in this case, produce hormones. It helps the pineal gland endogenously, in other words, naturally, produce mel more melatonin okay but it also i think is the principal mover and shaker in extending telomeres okay so that's why for me the pineal peptide is at the top of the tree okay the thymus peptide is respond the thymus is in our chest uh, it's quite a large gland it is unfortunately the first gland to atrophy with age in other words get smaller and it happens at puberty and some people believe that's the moment of aging from birth to puberty it's growth and development and then nature says ah you're able to reproduce time to die and things go in decline so a lot of key researchers in the field consider aging to start at puberty so in other words 13 14 years old mm -hmm. it's very sad but it's shown by the atrophy the shrink the shrinking of the thymus the thymus produces 13 hormones and they're peptides 13 thymic peptides okay there's been lots of studies on different and there are individual um uh, thymus um peptides slash hormones that you can use 
But by taking the thymus bioregulator, you're helping your own thymus produce more of all. So it's a much more natural approach. And of course, having a healthy thymus means having much stronger immunity. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so that's a fundamental thing about the thymus. It also, according to German trials, seems to have a major improvement on people suffering with rheumatoid arthritis. Okay. Um, and finally, as I spoke about three, the blood vessel peptide, which is actually from the aorta. And Cavanson, I, I interviewed him a few years ago, and I asked him about synergistic peptides. In other words, which combinations produce a greater effect for a given problem. Okay. Mm -hmm. And in every single combination was the blood vessel peptide. It was synergistic with all the peptides. Okay. When you think about it, it's extremely simple because what you're doing, they're doing a number of different things. There is some evidence of increased nitric oxide production, which is very healthy to help dilate arteries, improve blood flow, etc. cetera. Um, but you're also, um, by improving blood flow, what are you doing to every cell in your body? You're delivering nutrition more, better, shall we say. And at the same time, you're helping remove those toxins from the cells better. So it's pretty obvious if you improve blood flow throughout the body that that's a benefit. I could go off on a side story here, but I won't unless you tell me to. <laughs> about, about the blood flow? About this one? It's, a, it's about... Uh, blood flow and blood thickness specifically and arterial softness. Yeah. Well, I think that's, yeah, I think, uh, let's, let's hear that because I mean, this is actually, this is probably one of the big issues with most people. One of the things that's usually likely to trip someone up yeah. is a, a issue with circulation. And yeah. this is actually near and dear to me because, uh, this is one of the things that with my fam family history, oh, that okay. if I was going by that model, yeah. I would definitely pay attention to that. Okay. Gotcha. Well, you know, I won't go down too many rabbit holes here, but it's funny. I was watching a, a video just earlier today about a cardiologist doctor basically making the point that it, I'm not going go to go. I'm not going to tell the cholesterol story today. I promise you that. But he was basically saying, you know, if cholesterol is the big bad guy here for heart attacks and, you know, clogging up arteries, etc., how come since in, in the 50s, of course, there was an explosion in heart attacks? Uh, how come since the invention of statins, heart disease still remains number one killer? Mm -hmm. Doesn't make sense, does it? But anyway, I'm not going to tell that story today. If you want to have me back, by you know, uh, then I'll, we perhaps can go down that rabbit hole. But here's the one I like best, and it's something that at least every man out there can do, and I, I hope will be interested in. So these are facts. So a man up to the age of about 50 has twice the risk of a heart attack or stroke as a woman up to the age of about 50. OK, that's that's well known. Bit odd, bit, bit unfair for us men, isn't it? But past the age of 50, women catch us up. And by 60, they even overtake us in terms of their risk of having a heart attack or a stroke. Now. That to any researcher should be ringing bells and saying, well, what on earth is going on there? And the, the late great cardio American cardiologist by the name of Kenneth Kenzie wrote a book. You can still pick them up for peanuts on Amazon um, called The Blood Thinner Cure, where he evaluated at that time all the major markers okay, for the risk of a heart attack or stroke. And his conclusion in the book was there are two markers that are way ahead of all the other markers that the most important to know and they are your blood viscosity in other words how thick is your blood and your arterial stiffness and his conclusion was if you keep relatively thin blood and you keep relatively soft arteries your risk of a heart attack or stroke is minimal despite what your cholesterol c-reactive protein hba1c triglycerides homocysteine or anything else is doing okay now to come back to the ladies and the gents, what happens to a woman at about the age of 50? Well, she goes through menopause. Um, now, I wholeheartedly accept that as her estrogen levels go down, and her progesterone, by the way, because everyone forgets about that, but as her estrogen levels go down, typically, 
by about 60 percent okay so from her youth to her old age her estrogen might be 60 percent less by the way her progesterone levels can go down 100 percent right and again that brings us back to the late great john lee who wrote a lot of books about progesterone and that i think they're still extremely valid but so that's now we know estrogens particular kinds of estrogen have heart protective qualities so it can well be argued that the lady losing those levels of estrogen is increasing her risk of the heart attack okay accepted what happens to a man past the age of 50 and particularly at 60 do you know a man of 60 can often have more estrogens in him than a 60 year old woman because men feminize because the aromatase the enzyme that's predominantly found in in um, in fat cells and is responsible in a man for converting his testosterone specifically to estradiol is on the increase and you know that because the men put on weight they get the old boob situation going on they get you know um you hear an old man on the phone right you know it's an old man the voice is gone the fact you know that's maybe more to do with very low testosterone but what's happening is a man's testosterone levels going down his estrogen levels going up older men and in the women estrogen levels are going down although there is an argument that their testosterone is going up because the same enzyme aromatase in women is converting their estradiol to testosterone that's how women get testosterone that's how we get estrogen without us having ovaries and them having testes right okay so there is an argument to say those hormonal changes are increasing the risk for the ladies for the heart attacks and maybe maybe decreasing the risk for men but something else is going on that's a lot more fundamental what do the ladies do when they've gone through menopause they stop bleeding mm -hmm. they stop giving blood every month right the act of giving blood is forcing the bone marrow to produce more blood and in the act of that you could argue that toxins are being released a lot of people who are into bloodletting do it to get toxins out that's for iron, for iron also right iron is also absolutely but they're also forcing their blood to get thinner okay so you think oh that's all great theory phil you know lovely theory but it's not backed up by anything is it well unfortunately if you're a naysayer it is and that is if you go to the blood bank people and you get the figures for them and of course they've done millions and millions of people mm -hmm. okay it turns out that if a man donates one pint of blood every six months because he's altruistic right and we've got to keep the hospitals with their blood banks mm -hmm. of course we do he reduces his risk of a heart attack or stroke by 50 percent wow wow why because he's thinning his blood so keeping blood and that's not the only way enzymes can do it even drinking lots of water can do it but i mean i'm just making the point that keeping blood relatively thin obviously not too thin and keeping arteries relatively soft is extremely protective in terms of the risk of a heart attack or stroke and when you think about it to get a bit sort of serious for a moment if one was unfortunate enough to get cancer, most cancers, very sad situation, and but it's probably taken time to get to that position. Mm -hmm. And in most cases, there is still plenty of time to do something about it. Cancers rarely kill people that quickly. You've got months and even years before it might get on top of you, shall we say. A heart attack, you might know about it as pains down the left arm in the morning and be in a morgue in the afternoon. So in some respects, guarding against cardiovascular or strokes, of course, you could argue is at the top of the list because it could kill quick. So anyway, I'm, I don't put a depressing thing on this, but but, you know, in terms of prioritizing what your health requirements are you might consider that those want to be near the top mm -hmm. well that's a that's a that's a great um explanation of why those three are because like you said it's pretty much the 
um, conductor to the orchestra, the governor, whatever analogy you want to use, and then the blood vessel, uh, we need blood flow everywhere in our body. Yeah. And you know, the very recent studies, again, we've published this in the Aging Matters magazine, because that's what we try and do. We try and find the latest international stuff and put it in front of people. Um, American professor by the name of Reiter, uh, spelt with an R, R-E-I-T-E-R, um, he made a discovery a few years ago now that tumors only grow in the daytime. They don't grow at nighttime. And it's pretty interesting, you know? Um, and of course, the first thought they had was, well, what's in blood in the day? not in the day and it's at night, melatonin. So there are a number of clinics around the world now who are dosing very high dosages of melatonin. And I'm gonna mention one very fine gentleman by the name of Dr. Frank Schallenberger, who's in Nevada. And, and he can be found on YouTube talking about this. Um, and he's giving his patients somewhere between 180 to 240 milligrams of melatonin in the daytime because normally you take melatonin at night time. Wow. Um, and I believe they're doing all right. I'm not, I don't know if they've had regression, but I believe they've had no progression. So that's a step in the right direction, isn't it? That's so, true. and here's the weird thing, right? Here's the really weird thing. When the cancer patients take those extreme dosages, I mean, I would suggest that healthy people wouldn't normally take more than about three milligrams. Mm -hmm. maybe six milligrams but i wouldn't go above that um so with a cancer patient taking 180 or 240 milligrams normally if you were to take a mega dose of melatonin at night you'd probably feel pretty drowsy in the morning you probably wouldn't wake up too quick there is a way around it and that is go and get as much sunlight as you can okay but th th that will help get the melatonin out but but um but that's a problem. And some people, most common people say, oh, I feel drowsy using melatonin. So your dose is too high. Take the dose down. So, but guess what? These cancer patients don't feel drowsy, even on these mega doses. And I have actually got personal experience of a cancer patient who was taking very large dosages during the day. And when she was finally tumor free um, uh, for various reasons, I won't go into now, but, um, and it wasn't chemotherapy, radiation or surgery. So I'll just say that. Um, she decided to take some high dosages again, super drowsy, couldn't handle it. But then she was cancer free, tumor free at that time. So there's something going on there. Wow. Wow. And um, maybe we'll do that part two um, in terms <laughs> of uh, why you're probably not gonna hear a lot of this. Um, <laughs> You know, <laughs> you know, uh, you hear a lot of these things because, um, you know, this is this is a good tie in actually to the next segment that I'm going to talk about is um, it's like a 10 day supply. When I was when I went on the website, it's like a 10 day supply. Mm -hmm. And you also mentioned already that these are not things that you just use consecutively for 12 mm -hmm. months out of the year. It's something that you cycle. So mm -hmm. it's not a lifetime prescription mm -hmm. of just taking this thing, which if you get my drift. You already can see why this is in competition with another certain type of industry already. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So with that said, though, OK, so say I'm getting ready to I, I want to get this general protocol. These three, they are 10 days supply for each one. Yeah. Do I take each one every day or am I rotating? What's the order of mechanism to do that? Yeah, no problem. Jay. So first of all, if you had a problem, that you want to address you would take two capsules a day for at least a month 30 days so now you would take 60 capsules okay, okay. if you had a problem the russians refer to that as the intensive dose now i'm not saying that in their clinics they don't also use the injections and we could get into one or two things with that if you want me to but that's where they would start but it's pretty rare that the patient stays at two capsules a day every month. That's mm -hmm. pretty damn rare. Most folks, the 80-20 rule, right? Most, most things in life come down to the 80-20 rule. So most folks, at least 80% of them, would take two capsules a day for 10 days in the month, and the rest of the month, not at all. So that's why 10 days or 20 capsules, whichever way you want to look at it, because there's 20 capsules in a pack, right? Mm -hmm. is it is for 
at least 80% of folks is enough for the whole month. And then the next month comes around and you would take another 10 days course. And then the next month comes around, you take another 10 days course. It's part of this relationship between the genes and the glands and the tissues mm -hmm. where you do not need to, unlike a hormone, mm -hmm. where you do not need to supply every day. Okay. Now, if one is super fit or if one is seeing improvements, remember I said, give it one to three months, that regimen can come down to every three months. So now we're talking about taking these peptides for 10 days every 90 days. Okay. That's good news because it comes back to my cost and convenience, mm -hmm. right? Then it suddenly the cost has gone right down and the convenience factor has improved, right? So that's pretty typical for most people. Now you can take as many peptides as you of these bioregulators, I should say, all the time. So if you wanted to be on six of them and you wanted to spend 10 days every month taking all six, you can. There's no crossover conflict. There's not an issue there. Okay, okay that, that's good. So, okay. Okay, yeah, that's, that's very good. And so that's very easy to remember for someone. So, you know, so hypothetically, at the first of the month, I'm yeah. going through this these trio here, taking it for 10 days, and then... Yeah. That's it. And then if That's I right. have if I have a problem, I take it again the next month. For exactly. Days, at the beginning. Well, there, you know, there is a certain area of judgment that isn't clear because individuals being individuals, there are so mm -hmm. many factors right. in their lifestyles, their condition, etc., that we are we're unaware of. The issue is how long will those genes stay activated or silenced and when do they need to get that message again that's why typically it's it's recommended between one and three months to take a 10 10 day course hey listen i do know some folks out there who take it every six months right that that's their they're kind of super fit super healthy they're just kind of taking the precaution or whatever you want to whatever you, whatever you want to call it so um now my personal regimen because when I get up in the morning, because one of the problems is a lot of us who are in this field, we probably take quite a bit of stuff. Yes. Right? Everything, a bit of extra magnesium, a bit of extra zinc, you know, uh, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, whatever it is you're into, right? Whatever it is. But, you you know, oh, my, my Amigas, can't forget them, blah, 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 blah. And so you start looking at your watch saying, I don't think I'm ever going to get out of the house here. I'm taking this, I'm taking that, and the rest of it. So what I do... There are three peptides, as I've told you, that I'm on regularly. Mm -hmm. That's the pineal, the thymus, and the blood vessel. I get up in the morning. There's the blister. I pop two out. I swallow those, have breakfast, whatever. It, it, it doesn't need to be taken with or without food, but I my preference is to, with food because it's e if you're having some food, it's easy to remember, well, where's my capsules, mm -hmm. right? It's just an easier thing to do. Um, and then... So I'm take one. So for 10 days of the month, I'm taking one of the peptides. And then, oh, that blister's empty in the bin. Where's the other one? Oh, next peptide. So 10 days on peptide one, 10 days on peptide two, 10 days on peptide three. And if there is 31 days in the month, well, they're not taking anything. But it's just a convenient way for me to get up in the morning and be saying, where's my peptide? Mm -hmm. it, that really depends on how um, organized you are. You know, but there's no harm. There's no issue in taking all those peptides on one on 10 days if that's what you want. So that's really your choice. So it's all it's all about your pill popping preference. Exactly. OK, so because that will be if you do it all at once in just the first 10 days of the month, that is six a day. Right. Yes. Yeah. If you were taking three peptides, that's right. Yes. Yeah, that's six a day. I mean, to me, that's nothing. That's it's easy. Exactly, but, but to a lot of people, a lot of people do not like those. So that's once again where the bio individuality comes into this, and, and a lot of this is about your personal preference, and so yeah. you have to really consider that. And I think this is another good benefit of these regulators is that they're very flexible. Yeah, because a lot of a lot of different compounds you have to take every day. Yeah, let me just throw some dollar figures out there for folks now, uh, so they get an idea of what the cost of the technology is. Okay. Now, um, we'll talk U.S. dollars, of course, because the whole world knows the value of their currency to the U.S. dollar. <laughs> um, 
even if that's changing rapidly. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, uh, keep politics out. Um, <laughs> but uh, sometimes, all you, sometimes all you can do is laugh. Sometimes all you can do is laugh. Exactly, exactly. I totally agree. Um, so if you think about um, the cost, now they're not all priced exactly the same. There are basically three different prices. Uh, the pineal is the most expensive one. Um, you're looking at about, depending on how many you buy, because that's the old question. If you buy a few boxes, they get a bit cheaper and all the rest of it. But you're looking at between 60 and $70 mm -hmm. for, for 20 capsules, okay? The bone marrow one, which helps with stem cells, by the way, um, you're looking at about $10 less. So you're looking at sort of $50, $60. And then virtually all of the others are between 40 and $50, okay? Now, so if you're if you're going to take one peptide, at worst it's going to cost you around forty dollars a month. At best, it's going to cost you forty dollars every three months. Mm -hmm. So I won't mention any other names, but there are some mega expensive supplements on the market. Yes, where, where you'd be putting at least a zero on the back of that. Mm -hmm. So um, so from that perspective, I think I know not everyone will agree with me, but I think they're affordable. Yes. No, this, you know, honestly, when I saw that, because even the peptides, some of the peptides can, can actually get up there, especially mm -hmm. if you're doing some, um, very frequent dosages. So, um, they can get up there. Um, so when I actually saw this, I was like, wow, yeah. I was, yeah. I was really taken aback. I was like, this is fantastic. Another reason why, once again, I see why the other side of things would, want these things to be suppressed oh, oh of course the, i'm not <laughs> denying that we're conscious yeah. of and 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 when they you know in the world of health and fitness it's very hard to make claims i mean mm -hmm. basically as far as the authorities are concerned food supplements are meant to do absolutely nothing nothing um you know we we have certain here in the uk our agency literally has come out and said anything that makes a biochemical change in within the body could be considered to be a drug and therefore under their purview. Well, that sounds great until you think about it. So that's sunlight, uh, yeah. that's eating water, eating a steak, uh, going for a jog around the block. Everything makes a biochemical change in us. You know, it's just, it's a ridiculous statement to make. Very much so. Wow. That's, uh, <laughs> I can't. So uh, you, you mentioned the bone marrow. And so uh, I was just having a conversation this week about stem cells. Huh? Uh, um, and would that peptide be able to help increase stem cells? We are not aware at the present time mm -hmm. if it increases stem cells, but it appears from the doctors we've been talking to who have been doing various tests, it increases the activity okay. of the patient's stem cells. So that that is one is, that's kind of coming up, uh, or how should we say, on the rails sort of thing, mm -hmm. in that that's a fairly recent discovery that we're watching closely. But I think we're all aware that certain substances can improve the activity of our own stem cells. So I, by the way, just as a side note here, I went to a stem cell conference in the Bahamas mm, about two months ago. And um, that was very interesting. I found it very interesting, but a very good conference. But one of the things I was trying to advocate and suggest, because one of the biggest problems that stem cell clinics have I know there's a different I know there's different choices in stem cells and whatever but but the universal problem that they have is directing those stem cells to do what the patient wants them to do right um, and often I'm sure you know this you need a kind of trauma for stem cells to work you know I if you cut your hand then, mm -hmm. then stem cells will start going there as ah you know trauma start fixing it that's one of the theories behind cancer that the because there are cells cancer is us right mm -hmm. but it, it, it's just growing it won't go into apoptosis and the tumor gets bigger and bigger cancer stem cells they they see the tumor as a trauma and so they they're, they're adding and adding and adding to it in this in that particular that's a, a strange case but that's a different case but um with so i think and this is only my theory at the moment i have to say that there could be a role in certain peptides and particularly these bioregulators as specific gene switches to help instruct those stem cells where to go mm -hmm. 
So, you know, if you have a certain tissue, certain gland that you want, it could be very helpful to take the peptide with the stem cells and get more out of the $20,000 you just spent on those stem cell injections. Yeah, that's my whole thing with stem cells is why I can't really recommend it yet because it's it's too many unknown variables and and the the precise nature of usually what someone will be interested in those for is I, I don't know if it's even close to it's not even close to 100 percent yet. And we come back to the cost and convenience. Right. So now you have to be a, a pretty wealthy person, the kind of people that can afford to go down on a submarine in the Atlantic. Mm -hmm. to, I shouldn't mention that. Um, to um, to spend uh, experiment by spending at least twenty thousand dollars having some stem cell injections. Yeah, so that's one of the things. Um, so quickly, I'm, I'm going to ask some more about some of the other different peptides. But um, so hypothetically, you have someone who has um, a problem, a situation, and let's take the uh, you could say the lungs or the kidneys, right? They're mm -hmm. not performing as well. Mm -hmm. And if you have the synthesized version and then the, the um, the nature, the natural nature version, mm -hmm. the bovine. Mm -hmm. um, would it make sense initially for like at least that first month to do the synthesize since it's theoretically a stronger dose? Yes, it does. And that is actually what they do in the Russian clinics. They actually put the patient on the synthetic version for the first mm -hmm. month and then they transfer them to the natural. Now, I've had this conversation with the, the, the clinicians over there. Mm -hmm. And because this is a bit weird because a chemist is going to say, I'm looking under the microscope at this synthetic peptide, and it's exactly the same as this one under the microscope as a natural peptide. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the chemist is like scratching his head saying, why, why do they have a different methodology? It's a bit like asking, why does the synthetic vitamin be act differently to the natural vitamin? Mm -hmm. Okay. And I, I have two answers to that, but we'll come back to that. But what the Russians do with people with problems is they put them on at least one month of synthetic and then transfer them to the naturals. Why do they do that? Because what they say is the synthetics will work faster. Mm -hmm. okay? However, the naturals will last longer. So you at least have the possibility with the naturals to get down to those 10 days a month or possibly 10 days every three months, just depends on the condition. Whereas I would say there's a possibility that you may have to take the synthetics more regularly on that basis, okay? So there is a variance. How can there be a variance when the chemicals, when the formula looks the same? My only two answers to that are this. The devil's in the detail. Natural molecules may have a certain matrix about them. Mm-hmm that is not present in a, in, a, in a synthetic molecule. That's why I worry about the artificial foods that we're being inundated with. They're just presuming there's nothing else in there than fat and protein and what have you, right? What about magnetism? What about light? What about peptides? What about things we haven't even discovered yet, okay? Because there's something that's present in every molecule. It's called frequencies. And different frequencies, as we all know, uh, I think that uh, you may be familiar with the Japanese studies with water, where I can't forget the guy's name, I apologize. The French also did a lot with this as well, um, where different emotions into water, they held a different frequency. The structure of the water changed. The molecules rearranged themselves whether you said to the water, I hate you or I love you. And it didn't matter what language you were speaking or even they wrote them on bits of paper and stuck them on. It was it was a frequency that we're all, I think, all emitting. So I think and it could also explain why homeopathy works, because a chemist is going to say there is none of that chemical in that water. Homeopathy is a joke. But what if the frequency, as the as the Japanese have shown, retains in the water of that chemical so there's something else going on and to me my theory is that the natural peptides may have different frequencies mm -hmm. than the I, I when i did pharmacology many years ago there was a moment where we were shown there was a certain receptor and a hormone for example is en route to the receptor but it hasn't actually docked yet 
and yet the receptors reacted. How could that be explained? It can't be explained by a chemist, but it could be explained if the frequency from that hormone has already arrived. And that to me is, is a, so it's an area of, dare I call it medicine, that is obviously not, and of course there's a whole electromagnetic mm -hmm. medicine is all on a different, a different on those levels, isn't it? But everything has a frequency that this table, this computer screen, my glasses, every, everything's creating frequencies. The world, we're spinning on a globe that's every, this we're surrounded by them. Everything's in rotation. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it's overwhelming to think about sometimes. It's just like how much things are going on. And, you know, I even think about like with a lot of compounds that they're so, we have a great understanding, but there's so much that we still don't understand. Yeah. And this is a great example. Yeah. Most of the time, you know, it, for people with a little more serious of an issue, they start with the synthesize and, and then, you know, gradually move over to the natural. But that's like a. Oh, absolutely. The German doctor I met mm -hmm. quite a few years ago now is named Dr. Christian. And his study showed that drugs perform better during solar eclipses. I've never heard that. <laughs> he published it but that's that's one of the problems you were, you were saying about yeah you know, how do we get this information out mm -hmm. you know my old joke is i mean i don't profess to know everything i'd be an idiot yeah. if i did same and here it, i i just written a piece actually i hope to put in the next magazine called what can ai save us and i'm looking from one perspective which is to read everything that's ever been published and cross-reference it for us mm -hmm. most of the world's information isn't online it's like eighty percent of the world's population is still in the libraries, multiple languages, all the rest of it. Every year, there are a million medical publications produced in one year. Just the medical side of it, who can read everything? Nobody can. And so, every now and again, we discover something, and we and we go, "What? We've got about seven what I call wow stories." Mm -hmm. And this is one of them. These peptide bioregulators are one of those stories where, when you say, "Did you know this? Did you know?" and it's you know, they go, "Wow." It's incredible. Why don't we know about this? Why isn't it commonplace, etc.? So my old joke is, if you want to keep something a secret, publish it. Publish it. Yeah. You know, unfortunately, they said uh, there was a saying uh, growing up, and uh, this is a lot, a lot of families that um, um, if you if you want to keep something a secret, like you said, uh, mm. put it put it in a book. It's another mm. way. It's another way that people said it. Put it in a book because they're not yeah. going to read it. Yeah. That's right. Who's going to read it all? And, and even then, unfortunately, most of the nature is unfortunate of us humans. It needs to be repeat, repeat. And we've lived in this advertising. And we look at what we've just come through. Mm -hmm. the, um, the almost propaganda. Every 15 minutes, we were warned, you know, which with you switched on the radio, the TV, looked at a poster or whatever, it read a newspaper. The mess and bang, 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 bang. It, it's a kind of propaganda. And unfortunately, I think modern humans we don't get subtlety anymore, yeah. you no. know, and, and it's a very sad situation um, that stories need to be repeat, 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 repeat. And you talk about frequency. Yeah. There's no greater way to lower frequency than to constantly be bombarded with fear, with yes. death, with struggle 24-7. Yes. That yes. is an easy way to yes. lower your frequency yeah. I, yeah. I don't know psychops but i think we've come through something like that yeah and we, we get blase to it we switch off to it or whatever and coming back to the pineal and of course a lot of people it can over calcify it's quite mm -hmm. well known that the pineal can do that and there are methods of course to decalcify a lot of people and that you know in the hindu religions i think this spot here on the forehead is called a, the bindu or the bindi a bindu mm -hmm. i think and it represents the third eye, which is the pineal gland. And some people say this is consciousness. This is the connection to the ether for, con for universal consciousness. Mm -hmm. So, you know, all spiritual religions say you've got to get your consciousness up and get in tune with the universe. And, um, yeah, I'm beginning to think along those lines. I think there is I, I personally believe the computer, the, the brain is not a computer, but it's a receiver. Mm. So, um how do you how how do you raise your consciousness i could I, that could be a whole nother conversation <laughs> and so um i'm going to finish off talking i want to cover a few more of these peptides and um so the heart one was interesting to me mm -hmm. and, and in terms of like the exact mechanisms what is that like doing in the heart there mm -hmm. well um 
again, specific gene switches. Mm -hmm. um, it will help to uh, get, a, you know, arrhythmia or to negate arrhythmia, to get the heart pumping more regularly, more forcefully, uh, strengthening some of the internal muscles and that kind of thing. So, and again, that one, of course, combined with the blood vessel, mm -hmm. which is going to do two fundamental things. It's going to help lower the viscosity of blood. It's going to soften arterials, ar arteries, I mean, and that's a very important factor. By the way, all these things can be measured quite, quite mm -hmm. easily now yeah. um, through, through various mechanisms. So again, very synergistic combination to take. You know, I think about this. I, I, I don't, you know, this is just sticking off the top of my head. Um, uh, people who have had maybe a heart issue in the past, or mm -hmm. maybe sometimes people have got this long COVID and they have these other symptoms as well. And something to help build back the heart up, not saying not do this other stuff, but something like this mm -hmm. is going to help as well. Yeah. One caveat, Julian, and yeah. that is. I am, of course, talking about people who are not taking any hardcore drugs. Yes. Yeah. If there are people out there on, uh, I don't know, um, what's that blood thinner called? Dreadful stuff. Uh, uh, oh, I should know this. Uh, uh, I've done my mind's not working at the moment. The American one um, terminology uh, brand. Um, anyway, I can't think of it at the moment. But there are certain very, very Is powerful. It war warfarin? Warfarin. Thank warfarin. you. Yeah. Thank my, you. Da my dad took that. Did he? Did he? Yeah. Otherwise known as rat poison. Um, so, you know, because there's lots of ways of thinning blood. There's some nice natural enzymes on the market like limbrokinase or natokinase or, you know, even eating pineapple to get the bromelain out of it. Um, another enzyme that's very useful, a German product called um, uh, oh, enzyme, which is a combination of um, enzymes. Anyway, we could go on. There are always choices. There are always choices. But um, if people are taking hardcore drugs, then I have to, of course, say, watch what you're doing because yes. obviously for, so to go back to our favorite go back to the thyroid again if the patient is taking thyroid hormones already mm -hmm. and they start taking the um uh, uh the peptide they need to monitor themselves mm -hmm. because almost certainly they will have to need to lower the, the dose, dose of yeah. the hormone may even stop it just depends how much they need yeah. to take so but you know people who are taking drugs okay you need to take more caution. Mm -hmm. But what we're talking about is health and fitness. Yes. People with concerns rather than actual problems. And this is all for educational purposes and entertainment purposes. And uh, I forgot the other saying that I always say. <laughs> all right. so, but yeah, but no, that's that's true though. Because um, these things are, people a lot of times medications are um, going to be in competing with a lot of even some of the supplements and compounds out there now if you start taking notes it's going to affect the yeah. uh dosage yeah that absolutely. You have to take you know i've and seen people say, as a recovering pharmacologist can i say that most drugs are treating the symptoms mm -hmm. and they're not treating the problem so to come back to say warfarin why is the blood thick or why is the heart not um uh beating correctly as a you know why what you're doing okay you're thinning the blood i'm not saying that's not helpful and that's a step in the right direction but it's not addressing the underlying cause it's addressing the symptom it's like having pain of course you're going to take a painkiller i don't get me wrong i'm not against drugs but you know that that's necessary relief but the question remains why have i got pain right and 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 can we address that you know so Mm, yeah. Um, and I guess the last one we'll, I'll touch on is um, I think I saw one on the uh, the, the cart the cartilage. And yeah. um, so would you I would think it maybe ath athletes. Yes. Something. Very yeah, very much. No, the cartilage is another good one. Another another good seller. And I think over the years, I've discovered that there are a couple of things that not medical problems, but people jump to very quickly. One is eyesight. If mm -hmm. one sees a deterioration in one's oh, eyesight, I forgot to mention that. Yeah, we'll go. We'll go back to, we'll that. Back to that. Okay. Yeah. And, and people tend to react quickly to that. What I'm saying, right? Um, there's certain things people don't. You know, if you see your energy levels going down, it may be a long time before you actually address it. Okay, mm -hmm. and when you get really bad, but joints is the other one because as soon as you start moving your leg, your arm, your hip, your wherever it is, and you go and you're going out. Just getting in and out of the car and, and out when you stand up and out 
it's not long before you address that problem because it's with you all the time. Mm -hmm. So yes, the cartilage is a, another very interesting um, uh, biomarker, uh, uh, not biomarker, forgive me, bioregulator. Mm -hmm. Now I've got a bit of a story off on this and I could read you, lead you down a rabbit hole, but I'll just say this um, as a problem. Most people, let's take the knee, nice easy one. So most people, they, they're the two bones, of course, mm -hmm. and then you've got cartilage around the bones, softer material, and then you've got a substance in the middle called synovial fluid. We, think of a shock absorber, that's kind of like the oil in the middle, and then the, the cartilage is like the rubber <laughs> on the shock absorber, you know. So if you think of it like, I always use car analogies, I don't know why, I think most people get it. Um, there's a number of things you can do. Now, the problem might not be your cartilage, okay? Most people jump straight into my cartilage. Now, I got this from a brilliant surgeon, an Italian surgeon, who has done something amazing. We'll come back to that if you want to, um, in this field. Um, and I asked him once, I said, is it bone touching bone? You know, is it, he went, if that happened, he said, it's beyond pain. He said, that would be excruciating. That was the word he used, okay? So I went, oh, and of course, most people are not experiencing excruciating pain, right? It's painful, but it's not excruciating. So I said, so, okay. He said, what has happened in most of the people? Has there been some cartilage loss? Yes, quite possibly. Has there been loss of synovial fluid or reduced, in this case, reduced viscosity of synovial fluid? Yes, because in this case, you want it to be more kind of gel-like, right? Yes, he said that could be true in, in these people. He said, but normally what they find is the cartilage has become calcified, oh. over-calcified. And what happens when the cartilage becomes over-calcified, it becomes kind of inflexible. And the nerves that reside within the cartilage have stretched to an unnatural position. Ergo, when you move a little bit, they go, ow, they send the message. S some of the most productive, fast acting, and I think this is where the um, bioregulator is playing its primary role, is in the decalcification and softening of the cartilage. And what we see in as little, in some cases, as 10 days, in some cases, is and what we believe is happening is with the decalcification the nerves are going back to their natural position mm -hmm. and so a lot of patients after about two weeks go i've got no more pain wow it hasn't started regrowing cartilage right it's simply put the nerves back into their natural position so okay i'm going to go to jump to a different area then so like in the lungs yes um, that's still upregulating the genes, right? Yes. Sorry, I'm just having to write a message to my daughter, but I am listening. Yeah. And so, um, okay, so if we're in the lungs and upregulating those genes is helping, going to help with lung functioning. Yeah, what I can tell you a specific story in this particular case. So we had a Chinese, well, Malaysian gentleman, actually, mm -hmm. by his extraction. Um, uh, a very well-known accountant, at least here in the UK. Mm -hmm. And he loved vaping. Okay. And he vaped all the time, not smoked, but vaped. Um, and I don't know if that was a specific problem or the fact that he was buying, cause he was going backwards and forwards to the far East a lot. That he was buying these cheap Chinese vapes apparently. And, of course, there's been lots of questions about the, the amounts of heavy metals in these things, etc., etc., etc. Why anyone wants to do it, I don't know. I don't get it. it. Doesn't interest me. I see these clouds of smoke, like they're a steam train coming out of these people. Uh -huh. um, but anyway, he did well. Very active man was uh, going to be a pilot. Had his eye on buying a jet aircraft. Life was good. You know, everything going well. And suddenly, within a few months. He, he deteriorated so fast, it was unbelievable. And they took a look at him and his lungs were just messed up to the point where they were recommending at least one of the lungs to be replaced. Oh, Jesus. 
so life changing completely life changing um almost out of desperation he decided because he went through the orthodox approaches uh and his life was you know he couldn't work he couldn't get out of the house i mean it was really going badly for him so he actually started taking the lung uh, peptide in this particular case two a day within a month he was coughing up at first it seemed bad news mm -hmm. he was coughing up coughing up thick black mucus but it was actually doing something it was clearing his lungs of the problem and i'm not saying he's in the greatest of health today mm -hmm. but he has avoided having a transplant they actually now think that his lung is working to a reasonable capacity for him not to have a transplant now i can't put my hand on my heart and say oh that was definitely the bioregulator right it was absolutely given that the, the the within 10 days of him starting on that that this process of coughing up this thick black mucus started and actually that's what the bioregulator is it's actually taken from the mucus and the, and the linings of the lungs oh. that's actually what it is so that's my direct experience mm -hmm. with it although i can't say too much more on that particular one i'd have to go back to yeah. the for more information yeah we're all we're all in a void and the last one here just to kind of wrap this up because i know we mentioned it a couple of times is the eyesight and i saw that mm -hmm. there's like there's like eye drops yeah well yes there is a oral uh retina uh peptide mm -hmm. called uh, visualutin and there is also an eye drop although technically the, it's called can see the eye drop and technically it's not a bioregulator but it is a short chain peptide it's carnazin or n-acetylcarnazin to be oh. precise which is a dye peptide but it's not i, I know we said at the beginning uh what's a what the bioregulator has mm -hmm. to be a short chain peptide and then i said to you but not all short chain peptides are bioregulators they have to show that they're gene switches they have to show that they have this ability of both activating and silencing and i suppose i should say that as the head man behind this is professor cavinson that professor cavinson should bless it as a bioregulator as the last <laughs> <laughs> as, as the last factor but um in this particular case these eye drops which really weirdly are also russian um uh design although they come from a completely different institute in moscow the, the, the Helmholtz science Institute. they actually gave the world cataract surgery they were the first ones to to do it and design it etc anyway but it's very effective for cataracts um and it has to be used over five six months but it's been shown to reduce remove even dissolve cataracts so it has other effects but the clinical trials have been focused on cataracts specifically senile cataract um but is there anything else on the planet that has been proven? 89% of the people who used it for five to six months had improvements. And there are, I have eye photographs of cataract, no cataract in some people. I'm not saying every single person gets yeah. rid of it, but the fact is that you can improve the cataract, reduce the glycosylation within the cataract, which is the problem. Mm -hmm. The word cataract is Greek. It means waterfall. And I think it's because if you have one, it's a bit like trying to peer through a waterfall, right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of blurry. Um, so that gets reduced. It's the crystallines within the lens. So there's an anti-glycation effect. That same mechanism may also be responsible for reducing intraocular pressure in the eye. Mm -hmm. In other words, it can help people with glaucoma. And believe it or not, we actually also believe the same problem is the same problem for people with dry eyes because these cross-linked proteins which is what glycation is it's a reaction between oxygen and um, proteins and glucose um, yes it occurs within the lens of the eye but it also occurs in the schlem canal this is the thing in the bottom of the valve in the bottom of the eye that things are moved in and out it kind of like getting a clogged drain and so because can see helps to reduce these we believe that's how it in, is lowering intraocular pressure it's, it's unclogging the drain okay 
and in the lacrimal ducts, the things that put tears on our eyes. And you don't have to be crying to have tears on your eyes. The fact that we blink without pain is because there's a fluid on our eye all the time, right? Mm -hmm. From the lacrimal ducts. It's only when we get an excess of that that we see tears rolling down our cheeks. And people with dry eyes don't, they have that problem. Well, we think the same thing happens. We think that the lacrimal ducts get clogged. We've actually had people after using CANC for some months say, I don't have dry eyes anymore. And we go, well, yeah, but there are lubricants in CANC, so it alleviates straight away. We know that. No, I don't need to use CANC anymore. I haven't got dry eyes anymore. So in other words, their natural eye fluid is back on the eye. So that I think is fascinating. Okay. Wow. So, and when it comes to the retina peptide, we've got other evidences for macular degeneration, reversing. And in Russia itself, although I will caveat this with saying you have to use the injection to get the results, they have even reversed a condition known as retinitis pigmentosa. As far as we know, there is no clinic in the world that can reverse this rather rare, thankfully, and probably genetically inherited um, uh, problem than the one in St. Petersburg. It, it's called the Tree of Life Clinic, and it's run by Professor Svetlana Trofimova. And they are using the retina peptides. So that shows you the power of them, you know, uh, and in our little book, and by the way, there is another book I could mention, which is called Eyesight Saviors, written by uh, Dr. Marius Koyazis, Eyesight Saviors. And there's chapters in there about different things that will help different eye problems. And yes, cancer's in there, and melatonin's in there, and zinc's in there, and lots of good things are in there. But there is a chapter in there about the retina peptides. And that's good, because what you end up seeing is you see these photographs Mm -hmm. uh, uh, computer scans of the backs of the eyes of people and it, it's done in colors so black would mean no eyesight at all mm -hmm. red would mean poor eyesight uh, yellow would mean okay ish and green means normal healthy eyesight and you see the before and afters and everyone can work it out from that and there are some extreme cases in there the most extreme one was an elderly lady who was 90 that's 90% blind in that eye. And after a year and a half's treatment, and that wasn't every day, by the way, it wasn't nothing like that. Um, she was 30% blind. In that mm -hmm. eye. Now you might say, well, that's not a cure, is it? That made such a difference in that lady. So from being near blind to being able to see the grandchildren and move around the house, you know, and every doctor out there will know to take someone from an extreme end to a you know much more normal end is remarkable because normally across the board everything works better if you treat early yes so wow um i think this is a great stop stopping point here um we could have did this probably two more hours there's so much more that we could have talked about but i you know it's we're going on two hours and i haven't i don't think this might be the longest conversation i've done on here yeah so no no no. i i appreciate it thank you so much for for taking your time to to block out and just to um really go in depth with this um i i think this is a awesome awesome foundation you know we laid out the foundation we laid out what these are and also a protocol to get started so this is a like a definitive guide for people and so i'm, I'm going to Great. I have this in written format as well. I'm going to take the time. Thank to, you, man. That's to been have. my pleasure, and I enjoy it. And like I say, on a Friday afternoon, good time to catch me. Yeah, awesome. And and, and, and I know you're going to put links in in your video here yeah. where people can get more information and everything. Mm -hmm. So yeah, more power to your elbow, as we say. Well, I appreciate it. Yes, um, I will have all his information in the the show notes as well. And um, is there a preferred site? I know you have a different sites, but you think the Profound Health is the best one? Well, well pro no, I would say is to that. Mm -hmm. Profound Health is a store. Okay. If you really want information, the two main sites we provide that is antiagingsystems.com. Okay. A, a warning for folks: there's a fantastic amount of information on that site about a lot of subjects, but you can search for what you want. And uh -huh. you, hopefully you'll find it. And then the other one is our magazine website, um, which is kind of more glossy and, you know, magazine-y. Yeah. Um, and that's agingmatters.com. Uh -huh. So, and, and folks, although we charge if you want to buy a magazine, 
they can be downloaded free. Yeah. So awesome. Awesome to hear. And so I thank you for the book recommendations as well. And all this, I have a lot to study. I'll put it that way. I have a lot, to, <laughs> I have a lot to study and everything. And to think. life is a learning curve. Drew. We it never is. stop. It never stops. <laughs> Very much so. <laughs> but listeners out there, stay awesome. Be limitless. And as always go be the CEO of your health and your life. Peace.